um, we're moving now to our next lecture. Um, Agi Wittich um, will be talking about Iyengar Yoga for Women in Changing Time. Agi is a doctoral student in the Department of Comparative Religion in the Hebrew University. And she is also both a scholar and a practitioner of yoga. And if I may confess, I studied yoga with her and she's a wonderful teacher. So oh, hello and shalom. I don't know how this kind of works. Can you do this? Yes, of course. Great. So I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for coming. Um, so as uh, Rachel said, I am a doctoral student and I'm researching Iyengar Yoga for Women. And today's talk is going to be uh, drawn out of my preliminary findings uh, of my research. And before diving into this uh, amazing and interesting world of yoga and Iyengar yoga, I'd like to start with a quote. And this quote represents um, a very common uh, assumption among yoga practitioners, contemporary yoga practitioners. And it says, in the past, a pure and original yoga existed as opposed to the practice that is presented in the West today which has transformed and thereby lost the core insights of the original yoga. And I would just like you to bear this in mind while we go through uh, a bit of an introduction into the world of Iyengar yoga. And then when we get to the uh, claims uh, or the findings of my research, we can recollect this quote. So uh, Today, I will uh, focus on imagined and real histories of Iyengar Yoga for Women. And by now, uh, I assume some of you are asking, uh, what is Iyengar Yoga and what is Iyengar Yoga for Women? And I would also like to raise the question, how is it perceived by Iyengar Yoga teachers? So the first question about Iyengar Yoga, it is a contemporary a method or a system, or I'd like to call it a tradition of yoga practice. Uh, in the slide, you can see uh, different bubbles that represent different styles or traditions of contemporary yoga, and Iyengar yoga is one of them. It is practiced in more than 84 countries worldwide, so it has its own impact. And uh, interestingly, 72% of uh, all yoga practitioners in the United States are women. This is um, taken from a survey in 2016. And not surprisingly, uh, similar numbers are uh, shown in other researchers uh, worldwide. But this is note, um, so it is worth noting because in the past, yoga was mainly the domain of Indian men. And uh, this is a point I would like to make, and I will make, I hope, in my, uh, in my thesis, that uh, there was a shift uh, in the last century. Uh, women uh, prevailed the domain of yoga and changed it. So uh, many scholars today agree that mainly men were practicing, and the practices were accommodating uh, male bodies, male physiologi physiologies, and the needs of men. So then what is Iyengar Yoga for women? It is a practice that uh, takes into consideration the different phases in a woman's life, starting with puberty until postmenopause. And I like to say that it provides accommodation for the female body, uh, provides adjustments or small changes to postures and alterations or alternatives. So just for an example to make it clear, uh, one of the most known yoga postures is the headstand. And here we can see BKS Iyengar, uh, which uh, the, the tradition is named after him. He's practicing a headstand or shirshasana in Sanskrit. And here we see uh, his daughter, uh, uh, so we could say a pregnant woman practicing the same pose, so it accommodates women. Uh, here we see uh, the same pose uh, using an adjustment. So here we see a headstand uh, using ropes, sealing uh, ropes. Or uh, another example is of an alteration or an alternative. This pose uh, is, is perceived as um, providing similar um, effects for women. So Another feature is uh, taking each posture 
and then deciding whether or not it is good for different phases in a woman's life. I summed it up for menstruation, pregnancy, and menopause. These pictures are taken from um, this book. I will refer to several times, Yoga Gem for Women. And as you can see uh, in the slide, different postures are good for different times, and some of them are uh, recommended to avoid. Uh, and this goes actually even further. We can see charts of uh, taking one posture. Here is the example of Tadasana, and then uh, dividing it into six phases in a woman's life and then offering adjustments and alternatives. So it's, a, it's very um, systematic in a way. So if, I would, if, I, if someone would ask me when did it all start, I would begin with BKS Iyengar, who uh, started teaching women, and then his daughter, Gita Iyengar, also taught women, both women and men. So since 1936, Iyengar started teaching what became later known as Iyengar Yoga. He started teaching both men and women, which was uncommon in his time. Uh, in 1960, Gita Iyengar, his eldest daughter, started teaching both men and women, but then she spe specialized also in, uh, in, in groups of women. In 66, Light on Yoga, a very famous book, came out, and it had a small part uh, regarding uh, women's needs, basically what to avoid and not what to practice. In 83, this book, Yoga Gem for Women, was published, and it has, it has different chapters, what to do during menstruation, pregnancy, and menopause, and, and even more. And then, since 88, more and more books about uh, Iyengar Yoga for Women were published mainly by Western Iyengar uh, Yoga certified teachers. So I should um, disclose that I am also not only a practitioner, but also a certified teacher of Iyengar Yoga. So to date, we have eight books of uh, Iyengar Yoga for Women, and I know about two more that are about to be published. So uh, today, I'd like to, talk, to tell you how it is perceived by Iyengar Yoga teachers, knowing now that yoga was the domain of men, and knowing that there is quite a lot of literature about um, accommodating the practice for women, adjusting it, and altering it. And basically, so is it a new development? Is it a recent development? Or is it rooted in ancient tradition? Because uh, looking at it as a new development might, um, might seem uh, as a false or an inauthentic form of yoga, while seeing it as rooted in ancient tradition might give it the uh, status of more authentic or original or pure. So in my research, I conducted until uh, today 50, res uh, 50 interviews with Iyengar yoga teachers. Uh, I made an influence factor, uh, taking into consideration the number of years uh, practicing and teaching. Uh, these teachers uh, tend to conduct teacher training programs. They tend to conduct international workshops and publish books. And also, I read a lot of Iyengar yoga literature, uh, like this book and others. So, in my interviews, one of the questions were, were women practicing yoga in the past? So, some answered yes, it is an ancient practice. Some answered no, it's a new development. And some said they just don't know and don't even care. Uh, among those who said it is an ancient practice, some claimed uh, women practice the same way as men did. Some said uh, they practice a specialized female practice. And uh, I will give you an example for this later. And among those who said it was a new development, some contributed it to BKS Iyengar and some to Gita Iyengar. So referring to the ancient uh, traditions um, that Iyengar Yoga for Women um, sees itself connected to, in the book of Gita from 83, 12 uh, Sanskrit texts are mentioned. And just to... to uh, to reread some of them, the Bhagavad Gita, which is uh, quite famous, apart from the Mahabharata, is mentioned, the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, and also the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. And um, maybe most interesting is the Charaka Samhita, which is an Ayurvedic text, a text that has to do with, let's say, uh, Indian medicine for simplicity. 
uh, which is uh, quite uh, unusual to mix the two. And if I uh, look uh, lineage-wise, then the author of this book, Gita Iyengar, is part of a vast lineage going back to Vedic times, so um, 2600 uh, B BCE. And as you can see, she's the only woman in this lineage, so coming from an uh, all-male lineage, probably. But still, if I open the book and I read in the introduction, uh, Gita does point to several uh, uh, female figures as, uh, con as constructing or, or imagining um, a female lineage. So reading some of it, it was the goddess Parvati who first gained knowledge of yoga. Then she mentions uh, Maitreyi, who is uh, mentioned in the Upanishad, so 600 BCE. Maitreyi attained liberation through the practice of yoga. Then she goes on mentioning Kausalya, uh, the, um, a figure um, mentioned in the Mahabharata dated for 400 BCE, and so Sulabha. Uh, they have said to be practicing asana and pranayama, which are yogic techniques. And then the list goes on. Lala is a Kashmir uh, poet from the 14th century who is said to propagate the yoga system, and then uh, Saint uh, Bahinabai from the 17th century, and uh, Sharada Devi uh, from the 19th century. But we don't have so much knowledge about what does it mean that they practiced asana and pranayama, what kind of techniques did they practice, did they practice specialized forms uh, so accommodating the needs of menstruation or pregnancy, some of them were married, we have no knowledge of this, but this is um, a certain, um, well, taking into consideration a possible female lineage. And here is an example for Ayurveda or this Indian system of medicine where in one interview a teacher said, the Iyengars didn't develop a whole new yoga for women, God forbid. Half of it, in a way, is a reflection of Ayurvedic principles. Well, what do you mean Ayurvedic principles? And then I went on reading, and in one of the books uh, called the Women's Yoga Book, I will mention later, uh, Bobby Clenel, a senior teacher, an experienced practitioner, writes, according to Ayurveda, mala, which means waste, has to be thrown out of the body in order to avoid disease. Since the menstrual process is one of discharge, it's common sense precaution to avoid these poses. Do not practice any inversions until the menstrual flow has stopped completely. So taking an Ayurvedic term and then putting it into uh, the female practice of yoga. Another example is has to do with archaeology. We see these nice coins. And um, as one teacher explained, there's limited history of what we know about women practicing yoga. OK, but then he goes on. And this is unfortunate, because there seems to be evidence that there were women practicing for thousands of years. Well, I can tell you I spent only one year, though, but it was one year looking for these evidence of women practicing in the past, and I couldn't find any. I couldn't find any other scholars who did find any evidence, but this is the common belief. As another teacher said, if you see these old coins of, uh, which has yogi knees, which is coming from the Harappa Mohenjo-Daro's time, so 26,000 BCE, so women were always included in that, in yoga. There was no questions of not women involved in that. There were many yogi knees in that period of time. Another example has to do with carvings and temples. So uh, one of the teachers said, if you see any old carvings in the temples in India, you might see uh, female practitioners of yoga. And she said, I also imagine that maybe women were practicing for performance. So knowing things and imagining them at the same time. Another said, for me, it's obvious that there were women. There is no smoke without fire. And the ancient fire still burns. I mean, the fact that there are so many women practicing yoga, at least in Iyengar yoga, compared to men, it means that women were part of this. So thinking of today and then imagining the past. So my last example for this, not to bother you too much with my interviews, is, um, and I like this example, this is why I finish with it, is that uh, this uh, teacher has a lot of knowledge and probably read Gem for Women and quotes 
partially from it. Uh, she includes uh, Gonika Patanjali's mother, the author of the Yoga Sutras, one of the texts I mentioned earlier. She was a great yogini, the wife of Yajinya Valkia, so Maitreyi that is mentioned in the book. There were yogis, yoginis who are mentioned in texts like literatures. And then she says, I believe that during menstruation they I believe, perhaps intuitively, they sat more and practiced less forceful asanas during their period. I don't have concrete knowledge in my intuition, okay? As a practitioner, she imagines these uh, old women or ancient women. On the other side, some do think that it is a new development and then they contribute the development to BKS Iyengar in the picture or his daughter. And seeing it as a new development, there is more uh, legitimacy to these new books coming out. Guide to a Woman's Yoga Practice, the, yoga, the Women's Yoga Book I quoted from, and Iyengar Yoga for Motherhood and more. So one of the um, teachers, senior teachers, experienced teachers who think that it is a new development is BKS Iyengar himself, who <laughs> wrote in his autobiography, I, th I taught many girls and women ever since I started teaching yoga. I was perhaps the first person to take this art to the masses and also to introduce the training of yogasanas for ladies. Perhaps I was the pioneer in the field of introducing yoga teachings to groups of students, both male and female, and mixed groups in India. So <laughs> if, if, if the man says he started it, right? And then uh, other teachers uh, say similar things. Uh, one uh, told me he made special women's classes because he had the feeling the practice should be different, so different from the same practice men and women uh, were doing at the, time, at the time. This is why he was developing and was the first teacher to teach women. We do know of other uh, male yoga teachers teaching women, but uh, we won't go into it uh, right now. These are the this is how it is perceived. Others contribute the development to Gita Iyengar. Um, these all things grew out of Gita's teaching and things like Gem for Women, the book. She wanted to make a place uh, for yoga to understand women and for women to find their place in yoga. And other told me, as a woman, she understood that we have our own physiological needs as a woman, so BKS uh, being a man. S um, seeing how women's bodies change, I'm sure she was drawn to create a practice that would be more receptive and more supportive of health as we go through these uh, stages of life. And the last quote is interesting for its last line. I didn't uh, highlight it. She got him to see, so him, BKS Iyengar, that women should have a separate menstrual cycle series. It took a lot of research on Gita's part. She really changed things. And then we carried the word from Pune. So if this is a new development, then senior teachers can carry the word. They can uh, contribute to the development, and they can be seen as part of this new uh, forming lineage. So is it a new development or is it a root or is it rooted in ancient tradition? Uh, if we see, if we look beyond this binary, uh, we can see it, the third uh, option. And the third option is uh, looking at it as a developing science. So this, this was quite exciting when I heard this. One teacher said, I strongly believe that it's a science and it has to evolve. It is not, if, uh, if it is not evolving, that means it is stagnating. Then the subject loses its charm. It should not become a quackery. That responsibility lies on the senior teachers or the practitioners and those who are following. Guruji, so BKS Iyengar, has developed it so scientifically. So uh, coming to uh, conclusion, Iyengar Yoga for Women is part of uh, Iyengar Yoga system or method or lineage or literature. And it is perceived as rooted in ancient tradition or deriving from these uh, ancient uh, philosophies and also is perceived as a new development and it doesn't seem to bother the practitioners that there are these um, different opinions about it. Thank you very much. Yoga, a younger practitioner presentation. It's focused 
it's disciplined, disciplined, it's precise. And it's timed. And it's timed <laughs> to an 18 minutes. She promised it's going to be tw 18 min minutes and 10 <laughs> minutes. I was checking the time. So thank you very much. Uh, More time questions? for questions. Okay. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Yes. Um, you presented two different discourses. Uh, the first two discourses. One is looking at the yoga, yoga, yoga as a as some as a tradition from the past, and the other one is acknowledge acknowledgments of its actual actually being new. Um, did you get these two discourses from different people, or were they actually in intertwined? Did people actually say both? People can say the both. People say, "Oh, it's ancient," but you know, Gita developed it, and. BKS was the first to teach women, but you know Parvati was the first practitioner actually. And so, yeah, but then uh, many teachers didn't care. Many teachers just said, I don't know about history. It's experimental, it works, and that what, what counts. Um, and some said, so, I mean, some teachers hold, held only one opinion, but it was not uncommon to hear both, <coughs> sorry, both opinions coming from one teacher. Yes, which for me was a surprise and an academic, like is it this or is it that? But it could be both. So uh, uh, one more explanation I heard is that the ancient knowledge was lost. So these lineages stop at the 19th century and then they are reborn in the 20th century. Uh, I heard this also. Thank you. So I have a question for you, uh, the crowd, the people sitting here. I would like to see uh, the raise of hands, if possible, uh, who among you are practicing yoga or have practiced at least once in your life? Can you raise your hand? Oh, good. Okay. More than half. Aggie is doing research well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always researching. Thank you very much. <laughs>